Hello everyone, we're getting ready to look up today with a brand new Uplook video, tackling one of our top 10 lists. You can like the video, subscribe, and ring the bell to make sure you don't miss out on any of our future videos. Today, let's think about 10 keys for unlocking God's will. It's a sober fact that if you become a billionaire or a president, but didn't do what God designed you for, you would have missed out on his best for you. It's a wonderful moment when you feel the gears meshing in your life and know you're discovering that good and acceptable and perfect will of God, Romans 12, 2. It's not a scavenger hunt. God wants us to know but there's a way to find out. And here is key number one. And this is probably one of the most frequent questions that you've been asked. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And here's number one. Have I already done what I already know to be God's will? Now, the uh, Christian life is not a hop, skip, and a jump. It's a walk. and. We need to take the step that God puts before us. So he's not obligated to show me anything else until I take the step he's given me to do. Uh, Jonah wasn't thinking about going off and living a licentious life. He just wanted another option to going to Nineveh. But the Lord said, no, this is the next thing in the path for you. And so if God has put his finger on something, you need to get baptized, you need to witness to your neighbor, whatever it is, don't be asking God to show you something down the road. The Word of God is a light to our path. If you've got a flashlight, you're in the dark, you don't shine it way down there. You'll trip over a stump or a root right at your feet. You put it there and you step into the light. Then the light moves and you step into the light. And that's how God reveals His truth to us. So we have to ask ourselves that question. Maybe the reason God isn't showing me something else is because He's already shown me something and I just haven't taken that step yet. And number two, am I willing to be content where God has presently placed me? <laughs> we might say, Lord, I'm willing to do anything. Well, except what I'm doing right now. And two times in Luke's Gospel, chapter 9, we have people saying, Lord, I'd love to come and follow you, but let me first go and do this. You can't say Lord and me first in the same sentence. <laughs> Either the Lord's first or you are. And so sometimes we're just discontented with what God's given us to do. And we need to realize, no, this is the place God has me right now. And when we realize that, then God understands that we trust him and we're willing to work with him. We're not pushing him away and saying, Lord, I don't like your will, I want something different, like a, a, a petulant child. And number three, am I regularly reading the Word? That's where His will is revealed. I think that's true. 99% plus one of the will of God is found right in the pages of the Bible. Now, not always in the most direct way that I think. Sometimes it's a precept, a statement, Sometimes it's an example. Sometimes it's a principle God is going to use to show me. Sometimes it's someone else's statement in the Bible that may seem to some people not to really be directly related to the issue. But as I read the Bible, God speaks to me. He directs me through his word. Some years ago, there was a tornado that ripped through here, and I ended up working up north of town in a country area. And I was helping a family that they'd completely lost everything in the storm. They were living in their garage. And we ended up having a Bible study together. And the man said to me, I've asked God lots of questions and he never answers me. And I said, well, do you read the Bible? He said, well, no. I said, well, that's the reason. The way we talk to God, that's called prayer. The way God talks to us is through his word. You got a one-way conversation going there, buddy. You need to let God speak to you through his word, and he'll answer if you're listening for his voice. 
And number four, am I praying for guidance from the Lord by His Spirit? So that's that other side of the conversation. Exactly. And we all know uh, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord with most of your heart. No, with all of your heart. Be totally in on this. Say, Lord, I don't have a plan B. I want what you want. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Secondly, lean not to your own understanding. People say, God gave you a brain, figure it out yourself. Well, no, God gave you a brain so you can put it on the altar for him. Your body and your mind should be submitted to his will. So we trust in the Lord with all our heart, lean not to our own understanding, in all our ways acknowledge him. Some people just want God for a, you know, a marriage counselor and a, and a job placement officer, a few of the big things, and then just leave the rest to me. But God wants to be with us every step of the way. And so we not only don't lean to our understanding, but in all our ways we acknowledge him, and here's his promise, he will direct our paths. So let's cling to that idea that we need to ask the Lord daily for guidance, and we need to include him in all our decisions, not just what we consider the big stuff. And that moves us right into number five. Am I open to all the options? This really touches me because I actually was preaching at a conference and a bunch of preachers and I said, we're not going to see revival in this country until we're prepared to give God all the options. And going home from the conference, the Lord tapped me on the heart and said, that was a real good point, Nicholson, but I don't think you ever gave me all the options. We have these little provisos and fine print, little stuff here and there. Lord, I'm willing to anything, well, except go to India, except do this, or except do that. And the Lord says, I want to be the Lord. I want all the options. I had a friend who struggled all night long. He said, Lord, I'm willing to go anywhere, but not this particular country. And finally at dawn, he said, okay, okay, I'll go to that country. Lord never sent him to that country. <laughs> but the Lord wanted to have all the options. He wants to be the Lord. Uh, the will of God is not a smorgasbord where I walk through and say, I'll take one of those and one of those. We trust him and, and then he shows us what his will is once we're committed to do it, whatever it is. And number six, am I following the ASK pattern given by the Lord in Matthew 7.7? What is that ask pattern? Well, the disciples had asked the Lord, teach us to pray. And uh, the Lord is practical if he's nothing else. He's always showing us in real ways how to live out the truth. And so he gave us this nice little outline. It doesn't work in Greek, but it does work in English. Uh, ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened to you. And it's in the continuous tense. Keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking. And obviously the context is, uh, illustrates that because it tells the story of three friends. And the reason the friend gets the answer to his prayer is not because he's a friend of the rich man who has what he needs, but because of his importunity, says the King James, his insistence. He sticks at it. He says, sorry, if I was asking for myself, I might go home and go back to bed, but I'm asking for my friend. I'm going to keep at it until you help me. So God loves boldness and faith. And so I think the idea of asking and seeking and knocking is a pattern that God has given us. To ask is the repeated acknowledgement before God. I don't want my way. I keep getting in the way. I've had my ideas and they, they're not anywhere good compared to your ideas. I want your ideas. I want your will. And so I have to keep telling me that because like a little child who asks mother to do something and then keeps taking back and trying to do it themselves and messing it up, I need to keep reminding my own heart. That's what prayer is. I'm available, but I want your will. I want you to do it. So that's the asking. The seeking is to keep looking for all the options. Don't get committed to any particular option. But I won't know it's a miracle unless I know what the options are. When I go out and I'm looking for something that I need and all the options that I see are impossible for me to have and then the Lord provides, I know he did it supernaturally. So seeking is finding all the options, doing my homework. 
But then knocking is patiently waiting until God opens the right door and not moving until he clearly opens. The Lord says, I'm the one who opens doors, nobody shuts them. I shut doors, nobody opens them. So I can say, Lord, don't open the door unless it's your will. Or shut the door if it's not your will. And he's prepared to do that. And number seven, am I teachable listening to the multitude of counselors? Right. Uh, this is a reference to Proverbs 11, 14. In the multitude of counselors, there's safety. A woman called me up one day and she said, I heard you preaching the other day. I thought maybe you could help me. She said, uh, the Bible says in the multitude of counselors, there's safety. I found in the multitude of counselors, there's confusion. The more people I ask, the more opinions they have. Well, you know, I said to her, I have a bunch of commentaries in my library. How do I use my commentaries? If I'm going to study Revelation, do I pull down 10 commentaries on Revelation and start reading them? There would be confusion in that because everybody would have a different opinion. What I do is I seek God's mind first of all, and then I use the counselors as a means of safety. So after I've studied out Revelation, I'll pull down some dependable books and I say, Harry Ironside, what do you say about this? Or whoever it might be. And I don't necessarily accept everything they say. I now have the ability to test it against the scripture because I've already studied the scripture. So when I'm going to use counselors, instead of going and asking them their opinion, who cares what our opinion is? To ask them, here's the situation. What do you know from the word of God that would give me a more complete view? Or what has God taught you in your personal experience that may be applied to this? Now, after I've received all this information, then I have to prove all things and hold fast to what's good. I don't simply take everything that people say to me. I want to test it against the scripture and I want to prove it before God. And the Bible says, let the peace of God arbitrate in your heart. When I have that sense of peace that this is the will of God, then I can move forward. And number eight, do I observe how God has led great women and men of the past? Right, both in uh, missionary biographies and in stories in the Bible, we have these ideas of guidance. And I think particularly of Paul writing in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. And he is having some great gospel meetings in Troas, but he's really burdened about the Corinthian church. And he sent Titus to check in on them, and Titus hasn't come back with the news. And so he says, I'm struggling. What should I be doing right now? Working in the gospel with sinners. God is blessing. People are getting saved. Or going to find out about the saints in Corinth and how they've responded to this strongly worded letter I sent them. And he doesn't know what to do. And this is what he concludes. Thanks be to God, who always leads us in triumph through our Lord Jesus Christ. If I want the will of God, he will not let me make an irrevocable mistake. I may make a few side detours here and there, but he'll keep me on the main track if what I want is the will of God. There are times I don't know where I ought to be. I don't have all the facts, but I take a step believing that God is leading me. And in the end, he somehow overcomes my stupidity and rearranges things so that I end up at the destination anyway. That is helpful looking and seeing how Paul did it uh, and applying that to our own situation. Number nine, am I willing to quickly acknowledge when I have blundered and turned around? Yeah, humility really comes in handy in this department. It's a lot easier to say that was the will of God than this is the will of God. Uh, we've got great hindsight and we see how God worked and how he overruled our decisions. When we're looking into the future, only God knows the future. And so that is a struggle. But when I do make a mistake, the best way forward is to go back. Go back to where I got off the track and get back on the track. And so that's, that's an important principle. It's as important in knowing the will of God to know when I'm not doing his will and to retrace my steps to where I made the mistake and acted in self-will because 
going forward is just going to get me deeper into the problem. I need to be willing to acknowledge it and get back on track by actually going back to where I got off the road in the first place. And then number 10, do the next thing. Yeah, there's, there's an old poem that's called Do the Next Thing. You can look it up online. It's a great little poem, although it's written in kind of an archaic English. But Psalm 37, 23 says, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. So it's not only that I delight in the Lord's way, but he delights in my way when I'm following his direction. So it's the steps. It's one step at a time. That's how the Lord leads us. And I personally believe that anybody who is at all listening for the voice of God, they know exactly the next thing they need to do. Sometimes I'm in a counseling situation. Somebody's sitting beside me and they're saying, well, you know, this is the situation and I don't know what to do. And as I probe and ask some questions, they'll start saying something like, are you telling me I have to do this? No, I didn't say that. Well, I think you think I should do this, right? I didn't say that. See, I think the Spirit of God has already shown you what to do, and you're just looking for the courage to do it. But if we're listening to the voice of God, He's speaking to us, perhaps in a still, small voice. And if we just do the next thing, we may not know what God wants us to do next Friday. We may not know what He wants us to do five years from now. Some people are panicking and saying, Lord, you got to show me. And the Lord is a God of brinkmanship. And he sometimes doesn't show us until we get right to the edge. We got to trust God for that. Someone has said, stay of faith, steps on the seeming void, and finds the rock beneath. And so when we step out in faith, God will prove himself faithful. But do the next thing. It's one of the best lessons about the will of God you already know something you could do, so go ahead and do it. And before you know it, God will show you the next step too.